Hey guys, welcome back to Ebbs and Flows, where we talk about the highs and lows on and off the field. Today, joined by one of my oldest friends, one of my best friends, Quay Cooper. What's up, bro? What's happening, brother? Good to be here. Uh, obviously been in a long time since we've done a podcast uh it was hard to get you on that podcast but are you glad you've done it yeah i mean at the time bro like it's not something that i do a lot of you know, like speaking on podcasts and, and whatnot but back it was good to have that chat um and we got a lot out of it i feel like um sort of broke down the walls of who you are like you said you're pretty private and we talked about a lot of things and a few of the clips ended up going viral especially in new zealand like near Richie McCaw in the head type of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was cool to see everyone to see like a sort of like normal side of you and people who actually know who you are. So I thought that was really cool, bro. Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's interesting, bro, because like I put a lot out on social media, like keep a lot private. So like social media, just day to day stuff, but I don't really speak a lot on it about personal things and, and whatnot. You know? So it was good getting a few of those out there, but also just catching up with you. So that was that was a good good thing. Yeah. Um, so for people that don't know, what do you do now? I'm playing rugby in Japan. Got a clothing brand, which I'm I'm enjoying that journey. But just all over in Japan now, we got like three months holiday. So the upside of playing in Japan is is the break that we get. So as I'm getting older, 36 now, um, it's nice to get that break on your body. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, there's a few guys like I don't realize how big the Japanese competition was, and we'll talk about like this, probably the state of rugby and on this podcast and maybe even start that now do you feel like a, a lot more players are going to start heading that way obviously i've seen you go there Artie was over there at the time basically the best player in the world at the moment and he said he loved it like what's what's so great about japanese rugby it's not that like um the lure of going there like so one you get lifestyle like lifestyle is a whole lot different so you get some experiences and different cultures but from a rugby standpoint the, the comp's getting really good as I said, like on average, it's probably like 80 points scored per game. So from a style of play, it means there's a lot of running rugby, uh, a lot of ball and play time. Also, the f- physicality is probably not as uh, not as hard as it is on this side of the uh, world or or the northern hemisphere. But I think, as I said, like the the biggest thing is the amount of time you get off. So when I played here, when I was playing for Australia. So you'd start your preseason sort of January second. Um, you're playing games by Feb, and then you go all the way through to December, and then you get like kind of like the best part of December off. During that time, you don't get any time to just like put the tools down, relax, get away from it because you gotta stay fit. Um, you got to stay on your training because you know you're going to start January second. So if you think about it like that, you look at Artie's situation. Uh, He's just been playing nonstop since he came into the league, and he's playing at the highest level. So the best team and uh, one of the best teams in, in the world with them in South Africa and stuff. Um, and the way he plays is very physically demanding. So to be able to go to Japan, rest his body a bit, have a bit more time with his family, learn a different culture, a different way of living, that's really exciting. It's something that um, a lot of, well, this competition can't really offer. Um, guys coming through. Are you worried about Australian rugby? The state of it? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is, you know, because like you, you're seeing us sort of tumble down the picking order in, in the sense of rankings, viewership, um, and even like competition. Like I've been watching a, a bit of Super Rugby this year. See, I didn't watch it for a while, but since I came back in and started playing again, um, into the Australian fold, I started, you know, making friends with the, a lot of the guys that I didn't know from a different era, and so I love watching and supporting those guys. But it's also a little bit sort of sad to see the state of rugby because everybody in the country wants rugby to do well, and if rugby does well, there's an, another avenue for a lot of guys to be able to come into a professional environment. So if we if we lose rugby, there's going to be like AFL and rugby league. So there's going to be a lot of guys missing out on the opportunity. So once we had three healthy healthy sports, there's a lot of talent coming through. There's enough talent to be able to spread through all of those, but the games need to be up, run well, and I guess rugby needs to be doing well on the international stage. Yeah, because I think about that a lot. So when I like um, 
like you obviously you know i've been having a chat with the all blacks crew and when i was talking about like social media content based around them like if you look at rugby from a high school standpoint amazing like you look at south uh, south africa new zealand when they're doing those hackers super rugby used to be amazing like 10 years ago but then internationally it's like crazy like that world cup that just went past went down and watch you boys like a uh, rugby league besides origin wouldn't be able to fill up the mcg where all blacks versus uh wallabies even though that's the players load and all blacks seem to always win there's not many sports that could fill up that internationally you look at the kiwis versus australian game final last year it was played in hamilton and they had like seven eight thousand they couldn't give tickets away so how do we make the how do they make the like super rugby comp stronger or people to care about that part of the game so one of the things in like well, with like in the in the locker room on the bus and that like all the players always have this conversation and there's lots of different views on it um my view is like if you think back to sort of the COVID period where everybody was forced to do their own domestic sort of seasons. So Australia, one of the biggest things is is that perception is reality. So when we're in a competition with New Zealand at the moment, especially with this, the state of our game, so there's, there's five teams at the minute. We've just lost Melbourne. But whilst there was five teams, every week, let's say we're playing against the five New Zealand teams we'd be lucky if we had one winner throughout that. So the perception is is that we're terrible. Mm. And um, then you go and play Wallabies against the All Blacks, as you just said, let us own like 22 years. So again, the perception is we're terrible. So then whilst that COVID period, we sort of took New Zealand out of it and we just played against each other. So each week there was an Australian team winning. So if you follow the Waratahs, you follow the Reds or whatever, you always knew that your team had a good possibility of winning or if they won one week they might lose the next so there was like healthy rivalry um within that perception just started to become that to young kids who don't know about um the opposition or the history of it they just see their team winning Mm. so when it got to the final um Queensland I can't remember who they played might have been the Brumbies I I imagine they played the Brumbies and Suncourt was pretty much sold out again and it was the first time since I when we won the comp in that, they saw Suncorp fill for um, a domestic rugby game. So if I think about it like that, and perception is reality, if we strip it back, and I know that it's a it's more of a long game, then you start with the five teams, you play each other sort of twice or even three or four times to, to be able to get the amount of games, that product can start at, at a small scale, but you're going to keep fans in. Um, and then you just start introducing other teams. Like you could... I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but for example, Queensland, you might introduce a North Queensland team. Um, you might introduce a Queensland country or South Wales country, things like that. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but I think that the perception needs to come back that your team's winning so you can build the um, fan base again. Yep. Um, but also the, the club system is very, very healthy. Here. So if we can find a way to tap into that, whether again, like that domestic comp becomes... You, you have the Shoot Shield, which is the New South Wales comp. You have Queensland's comp. There's another comp in WA and get those healthy. Basically, you select the representative team from those. Mm. Um, so that's sort of one way to be able to do it, in my opinion. But again, like it's just about, bro, like really stripping it back and saying, hey, we, we got to this point at the moment. We're diving down. How can we sort of start again and recapture the imaginations of, the local people, our, our local fan base, build that up. And if you think about the NRL, um, you go back like 20 years. So they slowly built it up to what it is now. You essentially got to do the same with rugby. Because everybody wants a quick fix and go, okay, well, let's grab Japan and introduce some of their teams, take some of the money that they have in Japan, and we'll make a quick fix. Or we'll, we'll try and get a big investor and, and make this competition interesting by changing the rules or so forth. I think the fan base is the first place we've got to start. Mm. That's good. That's a really good take. I was just thinking about it then when you're talking, like I love about East and obviously the Wicks, like yeah. Wicks are like people talk about that passion more so than the passion they have for the Roosters or East Rugby or then when I used to live in Manly, it was, um, is it Rats versus Marlins? Like that was, yeah, that was some of the biggest games over. So potentially building in the narratives around that. But the hard thing I feel is um, obviously they don't have any money 
ARU has no money, eh? So it's hard to market a game when you've got no money behind it. But they can do it through different avenues. And I think the reason why rugby league's taken off um, is from that sub media. So if you obviously look at Fox Sports and then there was Ask Bloke in the Bar, Hollow Sports, that were just making content for free. I don't feel like rugby union had that because it was like a level where a lot of guys would take themselves a little bit too seriously. And there'd be Pig Athletic Club, like they make some funny shit. And then obviously the Coco Show, which are you like your boys. But like, I think just even having that old school, old heads, white collar at the helm of it, when it filters down into social media, you'll transfer it onto social media really well. But I don't feel like the rest of the leagues like followed. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing, right? It's like even, so the people that run it are still sort of, it's the same boys clubs, the same bunch of people. So when there's an overhaul, overhaul happens and they just replace it with their friends who have the same ideas, the exact same mentality. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that sort of the discussion that we were just talking about with the competition, everybody thinks, okay, we'll just change the name of it or we'll just um, introduce this or that, like quick fixes. Um, and sort of as you sort of touched on is that over the next few years, there's a lot of big things happening for rugby. So there's a great opportunity to go, okay, well, what can we actually do here? Whilst we're going to have money roll in, we can use that to, we can strip it back, but use this money to inject it and be able to help it grow it healthily from the ground up rather than go, okay, let's grab this money, inject it in and try and hope that this goes really well from where it, where it already is. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's the high school comp in that like around there? High school comp's amazing. So the GPS comp. So if you go up to Queensland and watch um, some of the big games, like the teams that we have and the crowds that you get, it's the same sort of energy that you see that you see on Instagram from South Africa, from mm. New Zealand. So when I was playing – Played against um, Nudgy, and it turned out to be a final. Um, we had like between five and seven thousand people jammed into a high school ground. So imagine that! Uh, like the atmosphere there was amazing. Um, there's a huge opportunity there for for rugby to do that. You think of some of the names who have come through, you know, like Al Michael Hunt, Dave Pocock from I'm just talking about Queensland, um, Kalen Ponga. There's so many guys who have come through the system. And then they've just gone off and played other sports. And if they use that school system to be able to, instead of having just a round robin, creating like a, a model where they have playoffs and so forth, maybe even like a draft system. So it doesn't mean that the guys have to go to these these teams, but if they create like a draft, a draft thing, it, it may seem a lot more important for these guys. Mm. And then it kind of guarantees them a fixed income to say, okay, you're drafted in the first round or the first draft pick you're guaranteed x amount of dollars um you know, so then what happens is like guys want just want to stay in the sport to be drafted number one to be seen as number one in the country and so i think afl has adopted that that concept really well in, in the sense of what the nfl or the nba major league baseball and all those sports in america do. Mm, i said i was just thinking about it then uh so obviously like do you think it takes too long for guys to get from high school to super rugby? Because I think about some of the, and like obviously you're an exception because you kind of went straight in, you went currently, but like sometimes when I hear about people's path toward the All Blacks or even just super rugby, it's like they go to a trade for like two years and they build themselves through NPC. And I know that's a better path for people to get through, but if I'm an 18 year old, I've got a bit of talent, um, I'm looking at rugby league and they're going, you can come train with the Broncos and we'll give you 140k off the, off the bat. During that little period is where a lot of good players start to get lost. But it's also, bro, there's like a part to that is like when you're saying come train with the Broncos and then you're listing off, rattling off a few of the names that they have. Mm. Like in rugby at the moment, we just don't have the name. So then it's like when you're trying to sell to a kid, come, you can come train here, there's an opportunity for you here. They look around and say like, who am I looking up to be like? You know what I mean? Mm. So I remember when I was coming through, we had Matt Gitto, you had Stephen Larkins. Um, like there was just players all across the board. Yeah, I feel like I could have named the Wallaby side back in the day. Hundred percent. I couldn't I couldn't name it now. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like I play the sport and there's like I watch some of the games and I'm like, I have no idea who some of the guys are. Yeah. But then there's guys who I know and we, we did this thing one time. We went through and just sort of kind of looked at the guys that we knew who were kinda of like the top of the game, um, and rugby at the moment. We just looked at their social media and we just checked how many like followers and not saying that followers is important it is bro it actually is yeah but it's not saying okay uh, 
that's the be on it. That doesn't mean you're not a good player if you don't have a big following. But what it was saying is that they're not known well to the public. And there was guys that are like frontline Wallaby players who are first choice, one of the first picked every time. And it was like, oh shit, they got like 7,000 followers. And look at someone in the Japanese league, like some of our like Japanese players who are still like workers. So they go to work. And they have more followers, you know, in a league that is relatively small unless you're an international player. Mm. Um, but for me, that was one of the things that I was like, it's a telltale sign that we're not doing enough as a game to promote these players and and also in, encourage them. So like when I played and I scored a try and did a backflip, I remember getting a bit of backlash from someone and I, I one another time is a story. So I went out to a regional um, school when the floods happened and the school's uniform was green. And so I said, oh, I've got green boots. I'm going to wear them this week um, as sort of representation of you guys. And they were all excited. So I said, tune into the game and you'll see me wearing the boots. Um, in the warm up to that game, um, I ripped my boots. And so when I went into the sheds, I was like, oh, I'll just tie them a bit different and it'll be sweet. And I chose not to wear them. So I changed my boots, but it was like the boys were lining up to run onto the field. And I was taking a photo on, on my phone and uploading it to Twitter. Mm. And so I uploaded this photo. Hey, kids, my boots rip. I'm not going to wear them, but, you know, i am still got you guys on my mind. Put my red boots back on, went out, ran out, and the boys who had already started running onto the field, I ran out. And the tweet said, like, sent two minutes ago, right? And then I kicked the ball off in the game. So then after the game and the press conference, I got player of the match um, and I come off the field and the first thing the media wanted to do was kind of have a crack at me for not being focused or they said to our coach, um, you and McKenzie at the time, oh, how do you feel about Quaid, you know, kind of just tweeting tweets out like two minutes before the game, it says, it says kickoffs at 7.30, he sent this tweet at 7.28. And you and McKenzie, which why I loved him as a coach, he just sort of turned and said, like, where well, we just won the game, man of the match, and you're in here trying to... Um, get an angle. Yeah, get an angle to try and bring him down, like try and bring him back into the pack. He said, that's how he prepares, and he's fine with that. So some guys, listen, have their headphones on two minutes before kickoff, and nobody says anything about that because that's normal now. Um, go back 10 years, no one had headphones, and no one was listening to music. So everything changes, but... The reason why I say that it was because it because I did that tweet, and I'm not saying it's controversial, but it was like it it was one of those things that was kind of before its time. Mm. Guys on social media and doing that, like now you've got media guys walking through your locker as you're getting changed, getting ready to kick off, taking a photo of you and uploading it to the team social media. So just for me doing that to my own didn't mean I wasn't focusing on the game. It's just that I knew how to prepare up. for the game. This part of my life was the same as it is as putting your shoe on, tie your laser, and walk out onto the field. Super simple for me. I didn't think any of it. Um, but it kind of created this like image. It, it cr created like a, a hype. And then, so that, that tweet got retweeted X amount of times. It was put on the news because someone said, oh, he tweeted two minutes before a game like, and then got mad at the match. You know. <laughs> so I think that there's... There needs to be more of an effort on like sort of promoting these young guys. I did it on my own without even really knowing it. Like I know I knew what I was doing. I knew that it would kind of create um, some type of noise around um, myself if I didn't have a good game or if I had a good game. It was like as my coach back me up and said, he played well. Why are we not just talking about his game? Yeah. So, did you see social media back then as like a way to put pressure on yourself? Because obviously you're posting a lot, and you know you're like you have to play well. It's almost like wearing Larry boots. Like if you're gonna wear those boots, you're gonna have to play well. Did you see it as that, or just something that was fun? Like I just saw it as fun, and I just saw it as this like uh, a window for opportunity. Because I was like, okay, no one else is doing this. I was tweeting. I think that I did ten thousand tweets one year, and I had had. Twitter for like three or four years and I did like 30,000 tweets. So if you look at my tweets now, I think I've done like maybe 32,000 since. Mm. So it means I haven't been very active on it. But the I knew it was super powerful then 
because after a game, I could just interact with people. Whether I had a good game or a bad game, people would come on and spray me, say, oh, you're this, you're that. I'd just interact with them. And so whether they liked me, they didn't like me, I knew that I was on their mind. And as we were sort of just talking about as we led into this part of it, I don't think there's enough players in rugby at the moment who are on the minds of people who watch league, who watch AFL, who just are supporters of sport. Because if they're sport supporters, they might not follow you or follow your sport, but if they know who you are be- because of your game, and that was a, also another side of it, I knew that first and foremost, my game had to speak for itself. So the things I did on the field, the way I scored tries, the way I passed the ball, the, the op- options that I chose, they were the things that were going to tie in with my personality off the field. Mm. So I couldn't, and there was a lot of players who saw what I was doing and said, oh, okay, well, I want the same, so I want followers, I want this and that. So I'm going to go do some outrageous things, but didn't really back it up on on the way that they played. They didn't have any point of difference in the way that they played. And just for an example, it was like like a vibey prop. (laughs) Bro, but uh, so here's an example. One of my teammates, um, and he used to do this headgear thing, and it was was a great idea because he was really trying to self-promote himself and, he would do these headgears each week with different um, charities and stuff. That's cool. But, so, like, it was a great idea, but it was like you couldn't really get much promotion for him because of the position or how he played the position that he did. So he was just like a, um, it's kind of like a grinder, grafter, did a lot of shitters for us. He was a really important player for us. Mm. He just hit a lot of breakdowns. But, like, if you look at T- Taniella Tupo, if you put the headgear on him and did the charity thing, it'll go crazy because, yes, he's the best scrummager in the world, but the way he plays, he scores these tries where he runs 40 metres, breaks through three or four tackles. He might not do it a lot, but when he does it, you see this 145 kilo. He shouldn't be moving. He like shouldn't that. be moving yeah. like that, who's different to everyone else. But like run, do a little no-look pass, something like that. And then everybody's just imagination's captured by that. And then now if you grab that and add something off the field, so if you knew his personality off the field, they could market the hell out of him. I know they try, but I don't think they do it the right way. He should be a lot bigger than what he is. Um, and prior to him, there was a guy called um, Rodzilla. Yeah, and I remember they had him on like some type of Bridgestone, Bridgestone tie ad where he had like a, a tie and he was doing like this um, Godzilla thing because it was Rodzilla. And so they marketed him well. But again, he had wasn't, the talent of what Taniella is. Like, Taniella is super special. And, like, he's got this big aura. He's a big name in the game. But if they managed him better, like, he'd be even larger than what he is now. Larger than large. Yes, yeah, so if you're the marketing officer of Australia Rugby Union, and I gave you a million dollars to put a, to build the game around two, three players, who would you build them around right now? Because I look at, like, say, Mark, the one I need to ask you, like, the look, Plays a winger, like he kind of looks yep. different and cool. He's gone to the league. Carter Gordon, who's a 10, we'll talk about We'll talk about him soon. Like he can't really build around. He's taken off to league. Obviously, you've got Tom and Thor there. Like who else is there, bro? I just kind of. Yes, bro. It's a really hard one because like, I don't know if you've watched many um, rugby union interviews in it, but it's like a lot of the boys are so, so worried about making mistakes in it. And, so I did an interview with Rob Valentini last year, mm. uh, or maybe it was the year before, um, when we went into camp. He's the one that kind of looks like Artie a bit? Yeah. yeah. So he's the most amazing player, fucking best dude. Like, he would literally be in the running for best and fairest every week. Like, just phenomenal player, does everything. Like, does the hard stuff, the shitters, the skillful stuff. Like, he can kick, he can do everything. Um, but we did an interview, and it was, like, so nervous and shy and they'd ask him a question, and you could just see him, like, get intense about it. But it was like, if you see him in our own space, or the dude's a, one of the funny guys. Um, you know, he's, a, he's got a great personality. He's funny. He's smart. He's intelligent. And he's a phenomenal football. You know what I mean? So it's just like finding ways to get the best out of these guys rather than just grabbing them and going, oh, he's a good player. Put him in front of the media and ask him a question. You know what I mean? Because that's not the way that um, to get the best out of him. But yeah, like, 
in terms of your question, bro, like the guys that I would build around, it's a, a really hard one to to think off the top of my head because actually Tong and Thor would be one. You've got a guy like Mark who, who they were sort of trying to build around him, but um, I don't think they did a, a great job with that. Like he was getting sponsors and stuff, so I think he was sponsored by Under Armour. Under Armour, yeah. I mean, he did some like pretty cool ads for them, but um, like ASIC should have had him, and I know they had him at one point, um, but it's just... I don't think there's been enough to try and build these guys. I remember years ago you had Honey Badger, and, and he was he was like a nice point of difference. Yeah, but see the thing was was like he wasn't a guy that was just picked first picked every week. Mm. So it was kind of like they were trying to build on him and go back to. I just said it was like his character was better than his football ability. So it was like really hard to. Um, really make the most of it but they made the most of that during that sm small period of time but he was a great footballer mm. but um, it started to become like more of a gimmick than like, him scoring three tries a game and doing scoring epic tries the po it was all about the post-match interview yeah and so then they started like taking the piss out of it like in terms of the media because mm. they knew okay if we lost the game go get a grab from him It'll be better. They'll take the heat off while oh, we just lost the game, mm. um, which is not really fair for for badge. And but I think what he did really well was marketed himself because he knew his time in the game wasn't going to last forever, and he shot his personality up. Then he went off and did the. Uh, he's kind of like show. he's like the Bo Ryan of exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. And so if you look at him before that, like he would have been not known to many people. Uh, only rugby guys and then he had his interviews and then he started like he was he used to research and, and it, that just wasn't just off the cuff it wasn't just him just doing that he was think about it kind of recite it rehearse it but that's who he was to the boys so he was always having these sort of jokes he always had the one-liners but then when it started to be um become like a thing monetize it and you like i was watching um Paul George's podcast and he was talking to one of the WNBA players her name's a unicorn oh she she had the shoes yeah and, well and he was saying are you monetizing this shit like and really getting onto it and it's like interesting because these boys think about it straight away if they've got a cool nickname boom they go off it's trademark exactly, straight away Jimmy Bucket trademark straight on your set yeah um, I'm just thinking about it so when I when I was talking to that All Blacks crew I, I think one of the biggest one of their greatest strengths is the All Blacks yeah. is they keep everything in house. Um, I think the biggest downside of like social media, especially within rugby union, is they don't celebrate individuals because yeah. it's always about the team. And when you've got the All Blacks, you've got a ninety-two percent record over the course of your history. You're playing in World Cup finals and losing, losing by a point. It should be about the team, yeah. but they don't allow that certain part of social media to shine through individuals. Yeah. Like they got they got some really like arties like. Signed by Rock Nation, like boys of Sir Khaleesi, as, as you are, um, Boating Barrett, both those boys are like really cool. When I'm talking to the boys, especially the Hurricanes chat, a lot of them are just even scared to try, bro. Yeah. They're scared to stand out from, move away from what everyone else is doing. Maybe besides someone like TJ, who's a bit older, a bit more yeah. comfortable in his skin. But all the other boys, like, oh, like I'm scared of being judged. Yeah, because you're, you're seen as not being a team guy. Mm. You know, so it's like, if you look at pretty much all the teams I play for, like, it's like, team motto is one team um you know what i mean those types of phrases where it's like everybody's the same mm. so everybody's got to be treated the same everybody's got to act the same and being a little bit different is kind of frowned upon so like i think that during my time it was a little bit more accepted at a point like at the beginning of my career it was like me being a bit different was like hurting myself you know because it was like I had this image all around like rugby circles that I was a very selfish person, you know, um, that, you know, I was, my character was always questioned. And um, like you said, so a lot of these boys are afraid to go out. And I just wasn't really afraid. I was kind of like, well, this is who I am. And I look back and I went about it wrong a lot of the time that I got it wrong. Um, there's instances that I had feuds with coaches, with um around the system and, and stuff like that because at the time of who I was in, I just wanted to be myself oh, 
and not think about the consequences. But I didn't really understand them. You know what I mean? So like I think that having guidance, having guys like yourself be able to go in and speak to these guys and say, look, being able to get your personality out there, it doesn't have to be done in this way that it's detrimental to the team. Mm. We can do it in ways where we can help you explore options where you can uplift yourself, but also maintain um, the team ethos um, and keep that team first mindset at the forefront of your mind. But by putting the team first doesn't mean that you disregard your own your own worth. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, I was talking to Ivan about Panthers a couple of weeks ago. I won't say too much about what we said, but I after that conversation, I generally think there's going to be like mentors or spaces within clubs like the smart clubs are going to figure it out earlier like the Penrith's melbourne's and you know how like they used to have like priests in there or, or sports sites you know those little phases coming i think a lot of them are going to have yeah chapman's i think they're going to have like business people come in teach the boys how to build per- personal brand without exactly what you said so when i was talking to ivan coming off free premiership so the, all the boys just done eventually to do clothing and, and do vlogs and stuff like that but sometimes it's taken away from chasing full premierships exactly like you said but i think eventually people are going to have advisors come in or mentors come in they can help these but i reckon eventually bro that especially in rugby league they're going to have content creators that are going to help them build their own personal brands and this is what i said to ivan i was like instead of like trying to tell them what to do create an infrastructure around the club so they can do the things they want to do without taking away because if you hung around me and i had cameras and i know how to film a vlog i'd be like oh cool it's been two hours here and we can go do it where you get like someone like Joseph Manu this here in the comp, but he'll go around film it and then do all his own editing and it'll take eight hours and then he'll jump online and stream. So I think eventually they're going to start building infrastructure around personal brands and businesses. So it doesn't take away from there. Yeah. See, one of the things with that though is like everything's about money. So at the moment for guys, I say, Joey, he's doing all himself, doing a bad job. Like I love watching his vlogs and, and everything like that. Um, getting in these guys to start doing that all takes his time and money. Mm. Someone comes in to do that job is okay, well, I'm going to be doing these amount of hours, I want, I want this amount of money, blah, blah, blah. But as you said, if we're getting rid of something and replacing it with something that's more um, like-minded to the direction of where everything's going, I could be amazing. And I think one of the best keys with that, bro, is like giving these like guys an avenue to kind of express themselves in a way that isn't I don't say negative like because back in the day it was just all about when you express yourself was like drinking partying together Hmm. whereas like now being able to go and like seeing the boys do music and stuff like coming up with like raps songs and you know things like that creating vlogs and that together what they're doing outside of the game like I really love that and that's probably what's lacking in, in rugby um, but like one of the things that I think will be key bro, is like getting these content creators coming in and not focusing on oh, let's build the brand of the Wallabies like everybody knows who the Wallabies are let's like build this content around pushing these boys individually like you said to be names to be known for something it's like say me doing slick passes like getting some of that on camera like every other day pushing it out so their brand comes if their brand goes up what happens to the wallabies brand rise just continues to rise rising tide raises all ships uh, yeah exactly i always think about that and like um like a lot of the analogies i give was always back to like movies like yeah. it, there's the avengers but every avenger has their own story mm. and it's from beginning to where they are right now and then collectively they become a team and they go take on the world yeah, and sure. if you look at like classic books or classic movies it's always built around individuals no one's always exactly the same like more people get more screen time in movies and that's got to just be the same as it is with social media until it gets to the, to the 80 minutes on, on football. No, 100 Yeah. Um, what was your Wallabies experience like? Obviously, there's a lot of your name, as soon as your name's in the newspapers, it gets brought up a lot. You and Eddie Jones, what was it all that what about? Um, I like it. Bro, I've got nothing but sort of respect and love for Eddie, bro. Honestly, like he was my first... Um, professional coach uh, that I actually played for. Um, so he gave me my first opportunity. I had him um, at the Barbarians like more recently. And so that was the first sort of time I got the opportunity to be with him like, and play under him as a grand man. So it was like a whole different experience because my memory of him, I was just shit scared of him when I was young. And he, 
he does play a lot of mind games and manipulation and stuff like that. But um, I had him as as a grown up, as a man. I just looked at it differently. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't scared. If he had something to say or I had something to say, well, I'm gonna go say it to you. Or if I didn't agree with someone, I'm gonna have that conversation or sit down and chat. Um, so when it came to the whole like World Cup thing, the reason why I was just sort of um, like sort of offside with it all was just because we didn't have that conversation. Whether he was busy or not, I felt that he should have just um, like called and had that conversation rather than just kind of like leaving us hanging. So it wasn't really too well, much. So they just named the team and they, uh, they, they, mm. there was like a process of if you got called, that meant like by Eddie, it meant that you didn't make it. If you got called by uh, Webby, our team manager, in the spot, mm. and he had sort of said a day or so before that I was like, he personally, like we sat down and had a little catch up before the All Blacks game that I was in the team and that that preparation camp was going to be super important for me to mm-hmm. like find my strides um, and really refine my skill set for this World Cup. Um, then, So you're thinking, fuck, I'm in. Oh, like I heard him say that. I heard him say the words, but I was feeling something out. So I'm, I met with, me and Sonny had like hung out together that night in the hotel and I saw Coda. I spoke to Coda on the phone. And all oh, yeah, we, I said, bro, I'm not going to the World Cup. And he was like, what do you mean? And he was sort of, and I was supposed to do this like big interview with this, um, uh, like Greg, this guy Greg, um, about the World Cup, about the journey, just this big write up um, about myself. And like, I just really didn't want to do it. I was making it really difficult. And Coda kept telling me, bro, you got to do this thing, like make sure you make time for this guy. Mm. And I just kept kind of pushing off. I don't have time. I'm like, and it was just because I was just not feeling great because I knew that I wasn't going to go to this World Cup. So I didn't want to waste all my time doing the story and and also waste this guy's time doing the story and have all this stuff because it was a huge story. Like we're on the phone at meetings for like hours. And I was just like, nah. And I told him, I'm not going, bro. Trust me. Mm-hmm. And he sort of said, like, why? Why are you saying that? I said, just, I don't know. I just got a feeling like I can just sort of sense it. Then I had that conversation with him. And when I left that conversation, like, yes, I heard it. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I really need to focus on this camp and sort of make a plan for what this camp's going to look like. So, like, for myself and the areas that I really needed to make sure that I was a lot sharper at. Then um, after the game, so forth, we lost that game. Kicked a, a goal to tie it up. I think. Or go ahead. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, Down to Yeah, the end. Yeah. And then I actually knocked the ball, which gave them a scrum. And that their scrum just belted our scrum. They ended up in a pen. Richie Mohs cheek kicks it. We lose. So like, I took that a bit hard because I was like, I knew because I dropped the ball, I came on with like, about like 10, 15 minutes or 10 minutes to play, kind of chase this game. I get that kick, that puts us in a different position. I'm still, now we're drawing, trying to, we get like a three on one and I was just like in a hurry. Just went boom and I looked and Whitey threw me the ball. As soon as it hit my hands, I felt the paint from the touchline on it and I'd already looked so I went to try and do quick hands. And I'd already bought, I just felt it slip straight through my hand. I said, fuck. Straight away in my head, I was like, okay, that's the game. Like, we either score there or they're going to get a penalty and they're going to kick it. Mm. I was like, Richie's going to kick this. I just knew that that moment for me, I was like, okay. I already had the feeling that I wasn't going to make it. But now that kind of solidified it in my head. Mm. Because I know how Eddie is and he's going to be super pissed off that I basically lost that game. So he's like gonna go, fuck it, I'm not taking him. Like he's pissed me off, you know. So that that's how I felt. And then when I went home, and then didn't really get the, um, we hear, you hear all the other boys saying, oh yeah, messaging each other, what time do we have to be at the airport? Or like what are you guys taking stuff like this. And so then I knew straight away, but I hadn't been called. Mm-hmm. So I was like, other guys have been called, say that they hadn't um, 
been picked. And I just felt like a little bit like disrespected in that sense. You know, um, I felt like I was close enough for Eddie Fun to just call and say, mate, like, this is why, or whatever. But as I said, like, for me, I was like, okay, I'm well prepared for my season back in Japan. I'm going to take a little break now from the pressures of this. So I'm just going to continue doing my training, go back and enjoy my season. Um, and having that mindset was sort of like to help me just get through that whole disappointment because, of course, I was disappointed. But my whole worth and reliance wasn't based on going to this World Cup. Whereas, sort of had this conversation a few times. If I'd done that earlier in my career, I would have, I would have acted out. Like I would have gone, okay, well I didn't get picked. Fuck this. I'm done with this shit. I go get on the post, get smashed, do this, go whatever. So there would have been a point where I would have just had enough and like try to self destruct. Yeah. Whereas I was like, okay, that's disappointing. But that's this part. I've still got this, this, this to do. I've got this to achieve. I have these things. And this has actually put me in a good position because I've got this extra work done. I've got the opportunity to play for Australia again. Got the opportunity to be around this coaching and see what it's like. Could I, did I learn anything from that? Can I take this back? Um, you know, so there's valuable lessons in it to be able to take away as well. Did they fuck up getting rid of Dave Rennie? Oh, for sure, bro. Because... Um, the thing was, was I feel like these guys are starting to come along too. You know what I mean? The games are getting closer. Right. I had, um, and again, this is like no knock on, on Eddie, but, I know, but it was like we were in a meeting and one of these things and he said something that I heard in this meeting um, with Chick as a coach was like, um, if they don't know what, if we don't, if they don't know what, we, if we don't know what we're going to do, how do they know what we're going to do? So who's saying this, Eddie? Yeah, but um, Czech had said it before the 2019 World Cup. Um, and it was like, the players, like we had no game plans. And it was just like about playing rugby without a plan. So it was just like off the cuff type of rugby. And then when I heard that, I remember thinking like deja vu. And thinking like, five. but I remember going into games with friends. And it was like, everything was so well detailed. And the game plans that he gave us. So like my job as a, 10 as a facilitator like I went out there and I knew guys knew their role but my job is to make sure that we execute that to exactly how and then also interpret it the way that they want us to play be able to facilitate on the field but be able to adapt and have my own um, sort of rendition of that so when we're on the field and like hey this part of it's working we're going to stick with so we're going to push this to the side and we're going to keep going at this part. Well, this part's not working. Hey, I can audible it and add in these other bits that we were training because that's what we need right now for this moment. And I think that there was things that we did throughout the week in our preparation um, and the skill set that we were practicing and so forth that our team was really on the up. And so if you look at those games that we played, those six games where we went six in a row, mm -hmm. um, South Africa, uh, Japan, so forth, then that tour wasn't great. But what that tour was was an opportunity to see guys that they had question marks over. So they were like putting guys into it, into the games. Like we wanted to win those games, but you could see what he was doing. And so we ended up losing to Italy, which we still should have been able to beat them with our second team. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't, we didn't beat them. So it put a lot of pressure and heat on them. But had to put these guys into that arena and see if they could swim, you know? And so, like, him being having that opportunity to do that kind of was, like, the beginning of the end for him. We ended up losing a few of those games. They put a lot of pressure, but they definitely shouldn't have got rid of them. The players, the respect that he had from the players, his ethos around it, him being able to build and merge all the cultures, because it was a very difficult thing in Australia is merging all the cultures. They've got a lot of islanders, so Māori, Samoan, Tonga, Fiji. Um, and then we've got a lot of Australians and different backgrounds of Australians. And then also the indigenous culture of Australia. So being able to grab that, let's merge that all together and find um, this culture that is represented, uh, that represents all of those, but ultimately we're still representing Australia, which is a very diverse multicultural. It is, eh? Yeah. yeah. It's a lot more diverse than you. 
100 percent so it's like but i think coming from new zealand which is a very multi multicultural place and the heritage is cultural with maori background bringing that in that's being able to blend that through with um indigenous australia australia and uh, pacific islands and everything be able to get them put that into a voice that was rugby hmm. was my second time yeah that's hard like we, now you're talking about it now because like when i think about like wallabies back in the day come out in track suits anthem i feel like the anthem's cool um but then see what's in you know yeah. It's not like the like most scariest thing. You look at New Zealand, like we've got the haka, um, the Māori anthem starts before it. Yeah. We all learn Māori songs when we were a kid. Now, like Te Reo is really strong over there. It's easy to bound everyone under there because they start to tell stories of like, like Māori's tell stories very really well and they use that to sort of connect everyone. Yeah. Like and when I think about it coming over here, it's hard because a lot of the Indigenous culture has been ignored forever. For sure. Yeah. The same brand. He did a, like, a really good job or better than anything I've been involved with was bringing that into the team and being able to sort of link all of that together with the history of the country. Um, but then the overarching part is the way that we played the game. Hmm. Like, I see that... Have you played with that much structure before? No, I haven't. Um, but it was one of those things that put a lot of time and effort to learn structure, so I'd say the past six years. Hmm. So before that, like... So when I came into the Reds, we played a game, so like back then, that era, there wasn't a lot of structure. And that type of football was super simple. Like, if you go back and watch those games, so like from a defensive standpoint, teams, all they used to have was pillar post key, which is like, if this is the rock, pillars one, post two, key is three. So that's literally all that structure was to defense. And then rugby back in the day was just up and out. Mm. So it was like a soft trip, so you always had time. And then South Africans brought in this blitz defense. And then so when structure came into the game, it wasn't until around 20, say 14. So you had the Waratahs with Czech. They played this game where you had had a thing called, uh, so they had the hammers, which was your front row in the middle of the field, and you had your sickles, which were your sort of locks and back row. Hmm. And so basically they would have a hit up here, get up, and just run across to the other 15. So they just do the swing 15. That's why they were called sickles, because they were on like this um, shave of a sickle. Yeah. And so you had your hammers. All they did, your biggest boys in the team, just moving up and down. So run, have a carry, get up, get back and reload and get ready to carry. These guys went from this 15 to that 15. So that was like the structure that he had. So you always, your landmarks, you were trying to play off of the middle of the field. So if you got to a 15, you had a short side or you can come back to the Um and at that point in time, I didn't understand structure. So, like, I really fell behind because the way that we played at the Reds throughout our successful years was all... Just give me the ball. Yeah, but it was like, so it's called motion rugby. Yeah. So, like, you're just playing um, speed of the breakdown. So, if the ball is slow, so I'll be standing here. And if we get quick ball off this rut, I'm just hitting the ball flat on the advantage line because the defense can't come up. So, worst case scenario, I get tackled just behind the advantage line or on the advantage line. So we're always moving forward. And then if it got slow, you just drop back and kick. Mm. Boy, you box kick. Um, but And so if it was slow, so I'd be waiting for the ball and the forwards would be coming around the corner. It was slow. Will would just play the forwards up. So he'd play them up and I'd try and get quick ball down, push up flat. And that's how we played the game. So it was just around the corner so you got to one edge. Two-sided rugby was Will would look, take care of the short side. So if we got like, pretty fast ball or slow ball and if it was like super slow and it was like the defense got it wrong on the fold because if you think about it, we're coming around the corner in a three defense is coming around the corner the same sort of thing if you beat them well, then you get the advantage they beat you and the ball's slow someone slows it down they've got the advantage because defense is right on the that's like so then sometimes we'll go short side or i'll just say to willie short side point 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 here run short side and play something there <laughs> then when you get into structure and now like most common theme that teams play is a one three three one, which is you've got a back row, a back row or a hooker on the edge, and then you've got three and a three pod to the middle. Yeah. And then like your last flanker. So then your flankers are able to just kinda of like but that's the most common breakdown, one three three one. Um so then like that system I didn't really understand until 
I started watching a heap and trying to figure it out. So I was like, okay, so what? The All Blacks were playing. And I remember one year, coach at the Reds, I think it was 2014, said, okay, we're going to play this one three one pattern. But he didn't really know. He just saw that Crusaders were playing it. Mm. So we didn't understand it at depth. We just knew, okay, you got three players across there. And then when you're running against no one, it looks really beautiful when you're just having the team around. You've got three guys there, you hit one of them, he might tip it on or do a little inside ball. Come around, you've got another three guys waiting, you hit them. Come around, you've got a back rower there, so he can run a blocker and you go out the back of it. Like, it's real pretty to, to train it. If you don't know why, or so like if you get to somewhere and say it's slow ball, where are you going to go? No. So like if you play off the sideline and this carries ends up being slow ball, you just go back to the short side. And so we'd still try and play open, and they just come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that year with the Reds was tough because it was just like, we didn't understand what we're doing. We understood this is where the people stand. What are they doing for him? What are we looking for? Yeah. Why are they standing there? Because we're just copying what someone else was. It's funny you say that because like you look at the Penrith system, like everyone talks about the Penrith system, everyone tries to copy it. just can't quite nail it, bro. Yeah, and it's because you just don't know why it was all, all personnel is the second question. Yeah, for sure. And evidence, evidence. Yeah. Like, if you stick to a system and every time you get points, wins, and eventually premierships, you understand the systems work. You play two games in a row, yeah. you haven't scored a point, you're like, oh, fuck this. And we're it's off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's where we're at. Like, when you look at the Crusaders, like, their makeup of their teams always had, like, a, a hooker who could, like, who was quite run. Yeah. So, you, um, Taylor, yeah. Bro, he's a back rock. Like, he's essentially a back rock. Um, can throw a pass, can run, and he's like solid. Mm. So these guys are back rowers, and then so that means that the guys through the middle of the field are big and strong as well. Um, but yeah, then like things started to change. Like you know, now you get like three, two, well, one, three, two, one, right? So it's a bit of a faster system. Yeah, because when you're coming off side, you still got three. Then you only got two guys through the middle, so it doesn't bank up. A lot of players, defenders, yeah. But a lot of the time, the downside, you hit them and they carry, you're going to lose a back. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you're down a back all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, fair enough, you get quick ball, you might not need that guy, might scan, not need it, push into number 10, get the boy on, you know, fast ball. But really understanding like numbers, systems, and that, I just didn't take an interest in later in my career because it wasn't something that you can get by on talent. Uh, yeah, and it will. Bro, the, the way that defense was, you didn't need it in the game. So what had backed up evidence-based to me was how we played at the Reds because we just were skinning everyone with this, this system because myself and Will were good and crafty enough with the ball in our hands to open up holes around the defense because, as I said, the only place that it was really structured was one, two, and three. Mm. So outside of that, there were holes everywhere. Then understanding the system but then even furthermore once I came back into the Wallabies with um, Rands and Dan McKellar I really sat on Dan McKellar asked him a heap of questions and I found him super interesting because he's got a really smart football mind and sense of structure he, he was the Bumbies coach for years so everything he did was based off having a good lineup and so everything I had done in the past at the Reds all we used to do was throw the ball in, throw it off the top to Will because me and Will were the best players. So everything was just off the top, straight to us. Mm. And so the ball was in our hands straight away. Whereas what they used to do was set up off malls. So you had malls, so they'd commit all their fours and then they'd play like peel plays where the hooker runs around. you got guy running short, guy on the inside, so you're attacking the back of the spine out. And once you start collapsing that area, so that, that seam, up so much space if you think about that 15 meters you collapse that seam people come in now you've got all that space with guys coming around and you're ready to just to get the ball to your best players out on the edge with an extra 15 meters um but i just never really took time to understand that so i started just like watching forward line out sessions looking at so i'd like review on the computer the forwards line out session not for me to go okay oh we're playing this move i need to know it which is to try and understand what they're doing, why they're doing it. If I saw setups in our own, then I understand the flip side of what was happening in the defense. So then when I come back in and I got picks, I was in the Wallaby squad for like about six weeks before I played. 
So I had this time to just like understand that study, it, study in there. And then when I had my opportunity, but I was like, okay, I know how I am as a man. Now. I know what I used to be like the last time I played. And when the last time I played, I wasn't bad. But now I'm like, okay, physically I'm better. Mentally I'm better. There's all these things that nobody knows about me, the work that I've done behind closed doors, even the stuff around the lineouts, the scrums, the fours play, starting to understand my teammates and my coaches. I was like, okay, not that this is going to be a breeze, but I know that I'm going to be able to give this level. So I know that I'm, I might not be a 10 out of 10, but I'm certainly not going to be below an eight. Like physically, I just, there's no way I can be this. I'm going to be at least between an eight and a 10. And I reckon if you look at that old version of yourself and the new version of yourself, the old version, the new version of yourself might be playing at an A, but you could make the three guys either side of you go from like a seven to a nine. You know what I mean? Yeah. And th that was the difference because before all I was worrying about was how I turned up to game day in terms of like, yeah, I feel good, like I'm confident, um, you know, like I'll eat well, like I'm in shape, yeah, I'm, I feel good. the weather's good. I was like, yeah, I'm going to, so I can step, I can use my footwork, I can use all my skills. Crowds turned up. Yeah, I, I didn't care about that when we played against South Africa. I didn't know if it was going to rain. It didn't, bother to, it didn't bother me. It wasn't something I had really factored in because I knew, okay, if it rains, this is the adjustment I made. Mm. If, if it's like great weather, this is the adjustment I made. But I knew all across the board what I wanted to do, how I can make the players around me better. Um, and that was one of those things, as I said, like, coaching point of view that I really enjoyed about being in that system with those guys. Um, so when I look to think about rugby league and social media, it transfers onto social media really well because a lot of the time the ball is always in play. Yep. We've got 10 meters of distance. There's a lot of like conversation that happens, um, a lot more space. So people get inside that palmed a lot more often. But then when I hear you break down rugby in a detailed, like I've watched rugby my whole life, but yep. didn't know anything that you said until I started hanging out with you in yeah. Japan do you feel like that part of the game is missing because when I watch NFL yeah. quarterbacks and coaches and break down the level of detail that actually goes into an actual game training preparation sure. and all the set pieces that come with line out scrums like all that sort of stuff like we don't have that in rugby league and our game moves a little bit quicker which is great for us but I don't feel like there's any media whatsoever around that part of the game which makes rugby rugby so this is the thing they, they try to do like a stand documentary and I know they've done one on the Six Nations, which is really cool to watch. If you haven't had an opportunity to watch that, you get a good insight to the players. But for me, if if they did like a... Because everybody just wants to get the scrum out of the game, like the scrum and line out malls, and everybody wants to remove it from the game, like from a viewership point of view. But if you go and spend some time, like I just sort of said I did, and kind of like got to understand it, you just see the intricacies of it. And it's like you watch anything in our... I mean, NFL about even the linemen. So all we see is, bang, them go together and holding each other like this, and then Brady gets more time to have a look and throw his thing. If you see the importance of that, and if that guy gets it a little bit wrong, he steps his left foot forward instead of his right foot, and the guy gets a um, bit of an angle and cuts Brady's time by like half a second, it's totally different. So if you, if they did like a series where it was about the scrum, you would just see how intricate it is collision that they have and then if the tv camera was able to kind of like capture that so you see the chatter between these front rows so if you watch a scrum and you see them talking to each other in that is heaps of right, there's so much chat like shit chat between like them um you know even when they're engaging they got their foreheads on each other and that's like talking to each other and they get like a little hit and someone might just do something small where they're just pushing their head into a guy um, you know, like the pressure that's around those spots, the line out you said the intricacies, intricacies around that change the perception of the game. So then you would get it to be like from guys who play the game, it's always compared like rugby league and rugby union as chess versus checkers. The spectacle of league, as you said, because it's an easy game for TV. Up, yeah. yeah, and you can pick it up and say, okay, I sort of understand what they're doing here. But with rugby, everybody goes, oh, I don't know the rules. There's too many rules. I don't know it. And it's like, yeah. But like if you could get a real close shot of that, you go, shit, this is, this is amazing. It's like watching NBA. You watch NBA and for like the whole game, you just seen it's just end to end. But then the last 
sort of 30 seconds of a close game, that 30 seconds goes for like five, 10 minutes because it's it's all about the smallest margin. You know what I mean? So I think that that's where rugby could sort of get an insight into that and it might change people's perception a little bit. And even like, um, I was just thinking when you were talking in, like when you go to an NFL game or a basketball game or NBA game, the there's more lag time. Yes, than a lot break, of stoppages. But the market, the... You go to the game, you can um, tailgate into the game. And then whenever there's sc- stoppages, like cameras are moving. You know yep. what I mean? Yeah. There's like kiss cams and all that sort of stuff. So if they market the game around like the actual experience of going to it, I feel like it becomes like a lot better. Because the rugby crowd is like a little bit proper, like quay kicks. Yeah. That's that. great. But if you don't know what the game is, it's yep. like, you know. Right. But that's sort of like what we were just chatting about is that when you get those intricacies, intricacies of the game, that experience at the game, you've got all of those. And one of the, the big things with NFL and that is that red zone. So, like, if you imagine this, right? So, you're at rugby and it goes to a, a scrum goes down. And on the big screen, they start playing the other game that's on at that time. You know what I mean? So, uh, like, you're watching the Reds v. Waratahs. But the Hurricanes versus the Blues is playing at the same time. Instead of having them all, like, one after the other, they're all kind of like at the same time. Scrum goes down, boom, everyone just looks at the big screen. There's a lot going on on, on the field and then everyone's watching this and you see like a, a try from Bodie Barrett. Yeah, that was sick. And then, oh, shit, the scrum's already getting ready to go again. You know what I mean? So it's like so many different ways and that's what NFL have done well because they've got all that stoppage and lag time. But they just fill it with stuff that's like um, exciting to you. Mascots, they do all that sort of stuff yeah. really well. Um, I think about this a lot because like in New Zealand, as soon as someone goes to somewhere against the world, everyone gets behind them. Like they could be touch blacks, they could be black cocks, which is like our badminton team. New Zealanders get around New Zealanders. I feel like over in Australia, and especially because they're not the same, but they're kind of similar in AFL, um, NRL and rugby. But like I look at the experience of like when the Matildas had a World Cup, the whole country just got behind them. Yep. You know what I mean? I don't feel like the Wallabies or rugby have that. Where like, oh, the Wallabies are going to there. A lot of the league boys, a lot of the league fans are just going to go, oh, fuck them, it's not rugby league. Or AFL people don't really care. Well, I sort of disagree with that. I think it's because of the um, results. Like, bro, I remember, so when I was younger, we would we would play um, a big game. And you had like McFanning, um, like you had all the league boys messaging. Like you, like guys really kind of like looked up to the Wallabies like something that they wanted to get behind. But then when something's not doing well, it's like it's very hard to get support for it, right? Because it's like, yeah, you're not doing well for one year, two years, three. After that, everyone's like, oh, fuck. You know, I don't waste my time. Oh, they're going to lose anyway. Because All Blacks Wallabies is the equivalent of origin, isn't it? Yeah. The amount of crowd you can get in and it's chin. But it's it's very similar at the moment as well. It's like very heavily Queensland dominated, right? So it was like, would have been four or five years ago when they started... Like, even though Queensland won it, they put two series in New South Wales to try and two of the games in New South Wales. Yeah. Or one of them. So one New South Wales, one Queensland, one in Melbourne. Kind of like make it a bit easier. I don't want to say easier. But so they were taking it out of Suncorp from having two. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the excuse would be, oh, we want to grow the game here, which is great. But um, similar to like the Bledisloe, we were like, you used to have two in New Zealand. But like, I don't think we've won at Eden Park in like 80 years or something like that. So trying to move the games both away from Eden Park so that there was a better percentage opportunity for us to win the game. Started things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but it is the equivalent. And I think that the moment that we're able to win that back, like we ought to change the narrative a little bit because a lot of people go, okay, now the ties turn, the hoodoo, whatever you want to call it, is broken. Now we can sort of build and, but if it gets too much longer, like there's going to be no one who wants to watch the Bledisloe. Like everybody's going to forget what the Bledisloe is. You know what I mean? Like you ask a lot of people in Australia what what it is, they won't know. It's true, because it just hasn't been here for such a long time. Yeah. Um. Obviously, got Carter Gordon coming over, similar position to you. Probably had the same opportunity that you had back in the day. Uh, two questions: How do you think he'll go? And do you regret not like? Well. I don't regret it because of like I've my career I've like enjoyed what my career is and I'm happy with it. But I 
I do wish that I had the courage to go back and do it at that point. Because I know that if I look back, I could have come back at any any point. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, did you think it was like this or that? Yeah, this yeah, or that. Okay. And like you think that it's if you choose that now, that's it. And it doesn't go well. Oh, that's it. It's, it's done. Like um, you you don't like you think at that moment it's it's this or that, and that's it. Like and if it doesn't go well, well I'm finished in the game type thing. That's how you think. With Carter Gordon, like I sent him a message. Um, I was speaking to him this morning actually, and I sent him this message and just said like what I said to, for a newspaper article that someone asked me about, and I said I'm super happy for him, not not because he left. Like if he stayed, like I love the kid. I loved um, playing with him, helping him, learning from him, learning with him. Um, as you said, I was like, man, I'm glad that you had the courage to go and do it, and it just shows the mindset that, that you have and the belief that you have in yourself because he's super talented. He's going to go really well in rugby league because I think that when he comes over to the game, he's going to have a, a kicking game that's going to, he's going to be able to put more time into it as well. He's got a good kicking game or he's got a really big boot. So like things like 40, 20 is on an early um, kick count. So if he gets out on a third tackle, deep in his half, bang, it's a... Does he have a big boot? He's got a massive boot. Oh. A huge boot. Yeah. And he's got good little kicking game too. He's creative. Um, But his pass, man. Like, I watch a bit of league, and I don't think there'll be anyone in the game that that will be able to, on the run, throw a long, flat ball the way that he does, which I think will be his point of difference in the game. And, you know, something that we just spoke about about rugby. The defense has all the advantage. They're on the advantage line, right? So in rugby. So you're always running forward, they're coming forward, so you've got them right on the advantage line. We sort of stand around about three metres as a 10. Mm. So like if you're trying to play flat, you're sort of three metres catching the ball at the two metre mark, so like they're right there. Now him, he's going to be getting the ball on the advantage line as a playmaker with the defence back 10 metres coming forward. So even if that's seven metres, like... It's still three metres. That's an issue, That's a fucking luxury. I mean, that's playing off a line out of every position. So I think that his time in rugby, being being so used to having guys in his face like that, it's just going to open up a whole lot more time. So this will be a luxury for him as opposed to the norm for every other league player. Not to say that he'll be better than every league player, but I think he's going to do really well. I think he'll be able to add so much value to the, um, to the side. But also, one of the things we spoke about earlier about um, his personal brand like whether he goes well or not there's going to be people talking and watching it because he's the wallaby number 10 and some people will be hoping he does shit there'll be a lot of people that are oh everything you're right in yeah, but there'll be a lot of people backing him bro because it'll be like one of those things that if you think about it like this if he does well there'll be a lot of rugby guys who go fuck I want a piece of that mm. because the game at the moment is seen in with higher value than rugby, like the the way that it's going. So the players, so again, like you look on social media, you look at the guys who are the top in the game and they're not even representing um, Australia in that. So just guys who are top for their clubs. Sure, they got like probably 100,000, 150,000 followers or there or thereabouts. Making like, if you get like a back rower on a bad side and he's probably the best back row, he's probably getting about 650 at the moment. There you go. Like, yeah. See, I, I don't know the salaries of the guys in Australia. But I imagine predominantly most of them would be probably only like between two fifty and five, like mm. the best players. I don't know. I'm just I'm just making that up, but that's just what I think. In Union, yeah, in in Australia, yeah, the best guys, yeah. So you still got the guys like um. So if you go back a few years, Hoops is on like one point two or something for like four or five years. As he was like, there was a lot of guys over a million mm. like when we were playing, um. But there would be no one like oh, Taniello would be around that somewhere. He could command easily that overseas. Um, then guys playing in Japan, like everyone in Japan would be of the stars from any country would be over a mil. Mm. Um, so like money that's sort of thrown around for the work that you do as well. So I look at rugby league. They, they work very hard. It's a fucking physical game. But they're all earning really good money. So I think for Carter, if he can come in, cement himself, 
there'll be a lot of people death right now, a lot of people supporting, but I think that he'll open that avenue and he'll sort of pave the way for a lot more guys to want to do the same. Marky Mark, coming to the Roosters, yeah. that's my team. How do you reckon you go? He'll go good, bro, because he's just, he's got all the, the skill set to be a great winger or full, like probably a winger or a center. Like his aerial skills, amazing. His size, like he's a big boy. He's not super quick, like top end, but he's just rapid. Like he can run fast and move. And he's just a big body. But he's going to do super well, bro. Like, cause you know, the, uh, the wingers in the league, they take a lot of head ups from dummy half, right? Mm. So they're, they're taking a heap of head ups. He'll be able to do that easily. High balls, who's going to score a lot of, a lot of tries. He's in a good system, too. Yeah. Good players around him, which fucking helps. Yeah, bro. Yeah, especially coming from like Tars, where like they've struggled the whole year. He's basically going into the superstar roster and they share the same facilities and not the same facilities, but within the same postcode. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. I'm excited for him. Nah, he'll be, he'll be good, bro. I'm excited for him too. Um, going back the other way, Joseph Suwali. Oh, Suwali, sorry. Um, how do you reckon he'll go? Oh, man, it's hard to say, bro. Like, again, yeah, he's, he's got all the skill set. He's, his background is rugby union. That helps, eh? Yeah. So, like, it's not that he's coming and learning a, a new code. Like, I remember when Tamana Tahu came over and it was like, T was such a freak in um, rugby league, his build, his skill set and all of that. But then when he came to Union as a center, it was like, he was going up against, I remember this game we had against South Africa it was Jean de Villiers and Jacques Fury. Both those dudes, like, 110, 115 kilo. That big there. Jacques Fury was huge, bro. 6'4", six, 6'4", six, six, and about 110 kilos, huh? Just a big barrel. And you watch this game, and you just saw the size difference. So, like, tall, long dudes, where Tamana wasn't, like, super tall, but he was super athletic. These guys were just massive. Mm. And so it was just a different game. So if you look at Joseph, he's built like that. Like, he's really similar build to, like, Izzy. Yeah. Um, he's long. He's fluid. Uh, he's played the game. Again, like I go back to that, is that a guy like T hadn't played the game. So he was trying to play rugby league on a rugby union field. He was trying to get on that skip on the outside, fan, fan, get the flick away. Mm. Whereas from your centers, you kind of need them being able to straighten up the defense, or the defense by straightening up the attack. Come around. Yeah, so guys could come around, like basically crashing and hitting up, and then you're using open side or short side. Defensive set being like a real pivotal role, like a cornerstone to your defense. Mm. Um, and so no one really put time in to teach it to him too. But like he he was a freak. And, uh, I wish that he sort of had more time in the game. I remember he left super and after a year or so. He sort of walked out. Yeah. But guy like um, Joseph, I think he's just going to walk in and um, be a really good piece to, to have and as we spoke about with the social media stuff, he's a guy who's already implementing that. So he'll help raise the awareness and the level of what the other guys are doing and, mm. and train rugby. Have you met him? Have you met Joey? No. Nah. Uh, best dude, bro. Yeah. Like, um, even after that origin, we were out on, uh, I was out on a Friday night and he was in Maccas. <laughs> like, we were both in Maccas. Yeah. And we were always drunk, bro. We were just having this conversation. But I talked to him quite a bit. But yeah, he's got his head screwed on, man. And I think he enjoys like being in the limelight. Like, yeah, for sure. He enjoys being in the limelight, but it doesn't affect who he is, which is like the nice balance. You know, Sonny's got that aura about him. When he walks in the room, you kind of like look at him. Yeah. I feel like Joey's got that about him. Yeah. Like I met him a couple of years ago. We we're talking about NFTs, we went for coffee. And bro, same thing, bro. I was just like, oh, he's like an impressive dude. Like alarms going off or doing stretching yeah. and stuff like that. So. See, bro, and that's, that's the difference. Those guys who have this perception of like, that they don't, like, they don't, oh, they don't care about the game a lot. But he's out there having alarms or when he's got a stretch and stuff like this. Like just because you put out this image that you're out there doing rapping, doing vlogs and stuff, doesn't mean that you're not still focused. Mm. I think that that's one of the things that the the public really forget about because they see, they don't realize that the stuff that you put out is only a smidgen of, of your life. So it's like even when you do, I do it a lot, like certain days in my life. And it's like there's still a lot of stuff that's missing from only capture a certain amount to put into like a 30 second reel or whatever um but yeah because like a stretch routine it's like 30 minutes it's not just like a three second clip of you doing one of the stretches you know what i mean so it's like i think it's going to be great for him and he might be a guy that's able to just like 
paved the way and set the example for a lot of these younger boys in, in rugby. And if you have a guy like him who's already doing these things, he's going to have teammates to follow and do some of the stuff he's doing and kind of like lean off him. Because Sonny had that effect with he come to league, back to league, and Roosters, I know a lot of boys were saying, oh, fuck, am I actually doing enough? Yeah, yeah. Like he'll do where all was training and then he'll be like last one on the field and he was in the physio room doing all this stuff. Like, nice. If you look at it, like I was thinking about this the other day, you look at a lot of the league boys now, pre-season, they have their shirts off, thank you if you're prop or an outside back. They're all like shredded now. And I think when I was playing, like we might have had Josh Mansell and Chico that were shredded and maybe some of the other boys starting to see a six-pack coming through. Like the level of professionalism is crazy. Now. For sure, bro. And see, that's that's one of the things that we were saying before is that even with me, like my diet and that, like a few guys messaged me about it um, this week. So sort I of said, I've had two weeks off. Um, not two weeks off. Like I still trained while I was away on holiday. Still ate relatively well, but it was bad for me. And I was like, Son, I feel like shit. So I was like, I uh, have this month to get back into the swing of things and make sure my diet's like really good. Um, my training schedules consistent and so forth but then when I when I look at that and look at what I did when I was younger it was like moments that we trained for so it was like ah oh, pre-season so pre-season was a time to get into shape mm. rather than coming into shape and using pre-season as a time to sharpen the sword you know what I mean so like if you've got that small amount of time like an eight week period instead of using that to get fit which is surface level so if you do an eight-week program, you know how people do 75 hard. Yeah. It's essentially an eight-week program, right? You do that and you get into this mad shape, but it's like it's not really ingrained into you. It's has who an you ending. are. Yeah, ha- has an ending. So it's like 75 days, at it, 75, oh, shit, yeah, sweet. Now you go back to a normal life or your normal life. So I think that an important thing for me, and, uh, and you sort of touched on it with Joey, is that being able to build those habits and disciplines that just reflect who you are as opposed to I'm going to get in shape for this eight weeks and then I might play good for four weeks of the season mm. and then I'm back to who I actually am. Now you start being inconsistent, um, start having bad games, bad days, and then you start trying to figure out ways I can make it better. So how can I get back in shape? Oh, okay, I'm going to no alcohol, no fries, no this and that. So you're just taking away stuff? Yeah. So there you never really built the foundation. So I think that that's a super important key, um, something that I learned. It's just build the right foundations, get the right habits, and then you're able to be consistent with it. Say hypothetically we roll into next year, and this is just me spitballing, but um, Lions, Wallabies lose 0-3, just say, for example, roll into the World Cup, boys that make the finals around. What happens to Australian rugby? Um, the, uh, well, no, it's like, I actually... Is that the end of it? Yeah, I, I probably don't even want to think about that, man, because, like, if that happens, like, yeah, I think there's, it's, it's not that it'll be the end of it, like, because the Wallabies will still exist, like, there'll still be rugby teams that will still exist, but the game as we know it, which is already in a really tough space, it'll it'll be all but gone, you know? Um, what do you think about the flying effect? Think about, I, I watch, like, some documentaries and stuff, like, all the time. You take one animal out of an ecosystem and that whole ecosystem collapses. So um, if you think about the wallabies, you take the wallabies or Australian rugby out of this ecosystem, what happens to the All Blacks? Hmm. That, was, that was kind of going to be my next question. Yeah. What, what happens to the... Because South Africa jumped, jumped out of Super Rugby and they play in Europe. So you take Australian rugby... Or like Super Rugby, you collapse that now what's going to happen with New Zealand? Because they're so far away from everything. Um, Could you make a, like a really strong New Zealand competition? And they already have a really strong New Zealand So like say like 10 of the 30 Wallabies go over and play for Crusaders or like that almost becomes, it's very like small, the, yeah. small, you know what I mean? It almost comes like the EPL yep. of club rugby. Yep. Did that happen? Because I know the French comp is super strong. You could definitely do that. Yeah. Um, but now would guys want to go over and live in New Zealand? Like yeah, when you live over, you know what I mean. Like it's it's a interesting thing because one of the aspects of 
playing in so I went and stayed in Bordeaux. Yeah, go play in South Island or the South of France. <laughs> that's where I'm. That's where I'm leading to. But it was like so. Ben Tapwai, one of my best friends, I went and stayed with him for like three or four days in Bordeaux, and he's our age, and he's still playing really well, playing over in the south, uh, in in France at Bordeaux, in a great city, beautiful place, and we were talking about like the game as a whole, right? Now, the beauty of playing over there and being able to come back and play for the All Blacks or the Wallabies or whatever it is, is you play with the French, you play with guys who play for um, South Africa. You, I, I, sorry, I was talking with him and Khaleesi about it. And you actually get an insight into what makes these guys tick, into what how they see the game. So like me and Khaleesi talking about so that the behind the lines with South Africa, I'm like shit. That's super interesting. That's something that we don't do in Australia. Or I know you guys are. <laughs> yeah, but do you know what I mean? So it's like now you're around Colisi, you're around the Irish boys, you're around the French guys. Oh, yeah. oh, exactly. So then when you go back and play for Australia, yeah, you've iron sharpens iron. So you've been around these guys every day. You see what they do every day. You hear stories about what South Africa did about what France do, about how they play, why they do certain things. Now, being able to take that back to your country, it's invaluable. Now, if you go back to the model you just spoke about and like you isolate yourself even further, you only know what you know. So you only know the way that you guys do it. So you have no real insight into what these other countries are doing. So now you go into a game and you might have the best style of play at the minute and everyone's trying to sort of copy you, but they're going to figure out their own rendition of it they're going to figure out okay i'm going to take what the all blacks are doing but we're going to add our spice um and then that becomes the way of playing now because you're so isolated what do you do you know so like there's there's no there's no like second option so i think that that's really not the way to go they've got to figure out a way to um to work this all out but when super rugby was um, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. Like we were speaking about it in Coliseum, and we said, "Fuck, those are the days." Like the games were hard. You played against South Africa, you had this really physical game. Then you go over against New Zealand, you got like a physical, fast game. Then the Australian derbies were just like grinds. But then the way that they viewed us, it was like it was really hard to play against the Australians. You play against New Zealand, it was ultimate because it was physical and like a super fast way of playing. Um, so that competition, that's why those three teams were one, two, and three in the world consistently. So I remember one time we were three, we got our way up to two, we had a game against the All Blacks, and then we could have got to one, we lost, so we're staying there, like we're in reach of it. Um, now South Africa gone, we're just playing in this comp, like you look how far we're sort of slowly dropping down, and other teams are coming up. Yeah. So you introduce these teams like Fiji, See, as good as it is having these guys in like I think that it's great having Fiji and, and that in there. But if I think about this, if I'm thinking like international rugby and that, they don't really want these teams that they invest a little bit into them, but they should be investing more into them. But for them, it doesn't make sense for Fiji to keep beating Australia, to keep beating these big teams because the the small Pacific Island nations not bringing in any money. So it's like. They're never going to invest proper, properly in these places because they're just going to keep taking individuals. They're going to use it as a breeding ground for them. They say that they're investing money. Yeah. That's, yeah, they want to get like Rodrigo over there. Yeah. They don't want Rodrigo playing for Fiji. They want him playing in France and that. You know, so it's like, um, but having like the Drew and Super Rugby, you see how much like guys who are just guys playing on the islands talent and the skill that they've got um japan are doing something similar with the the pathways program that they have uh, which is giving great opportunity for guys to come through and play for japan but yeah like i think that the all this talk around the, yeah, the that, that is a bit of a trip out when you watch the japanese side and he's yeah. like big v jeans and he was like they do them with japanese to me yeah. it's, it's crazy bro, <laughs> guns too there's some crazy talent over there mm. yeah bro so what do you reckon the, like, say, let's put our hat on it towards the future. What do you reckon the three big leagues are going to be club-wise? Do you think it's going to be Viva, 
Viva was um, English A, eh? the English comp, the French comp, and probably Japanese comp. Is that I don't think the English comp. Are they going down too? Yeah, they're, they're they're struggling. Like they're struggling, but I think they've they've had a little bit of a comeback. Like they've increased their salary cap and that. But um, yeah, the English comp is like a good comp. Like there's good footy in that play, but because it's privately owned, like um, it's up and down. Like there's a lot of bad stuff that's happened to a lot of players that. At clubs, just clubs shutting down, and like owners. London wasps are gone. Yeah, the wasps are gone. London Irish, like, and guys are just left without jobs. Like, let's imagine going into training Tuesday, Wednesday a day off, and you go to go back Thursday, and there's no club anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got your whole family, house, everything, and now you've got to try and find a gig somewhere. Like that happened to think of the list of players. Like, say forty players countless staff like I'd hate to know how many staff and like it's really difficult for staff as well is um yeah, like Brad Shields from um Hurricanes he was over there for a bit uh Wasp just went into administration yeah had to, like he's scratching around for a contract exactly bro so it's like it's a really interesting time like over there in um England the French comp's like really strong um same thing though like they're do they have, do they have like private owners like back does that is yeah. it so it's all the same like they're all um billionaires who own the the teams but also the league is making a lot of money through tv rights like rugby's their number two sport you know so like i don't know the population of um france but there's a lot of people watching the game because tv rights is good um the competition's super strong man like i watched bordeaux play um in their last game of the season and as i said i was watching this game and as I was watching the game and the level that they were playing at, even in the warm-up, I was like, okay, like, maybe I want to um, play another year at this level, you know? Like, it's it's super fun playing in Japan, but when I saw that level and that competitive side came out again, I was like, oh, shit, it is a different level. But mm-hmm. to answer your question, in the future, the Japanese league, the French league, and then there's a huge question mark over what could happen down there. down there because the reality is is it was only like what less than 10 years ago that this is the best comp in the world so super rugby was the best comp in the world mm. and now it's not you know it's not it's not even the um top top two you know so can you see like a um almost like a champions league style thing happen with clubs because that's what i was thinking where like say you get the best two teams from each country say crusaders blues i don't know Brumbies, Reds yeah, over here. What happens because they're the two best, right? Yeah. So what happens to the rest? You know, so then like they they've still got to make money somehow. You know? And so in Europe, so sort of they, sort of have the like national competitions, like you said here. New Zealand has that. The two best go on into a pool, go play somewhere. The, then that rolls into international. There's just heaps of problems with that, in my opinion, because. It's always your best players who are just playing so much more rugby mm. and they're just getting burnt out. Then the bottom guys are not doing anything. So they're always just on break. So then the clubs go, oh, well, we're going to make you train to get our money's worth because we pay you all year round. Um, so one of the things that they do in Europe is they have the um, European Cup and then they have the Champions, Champions Cup. So it's like the top half of the table and Europeans Cup, mm. bottom half and champions. So they still have like a second yeah, yeah. tier competition so if you're going to do that competition as you said you just go like top five bottom five and have a second tier comp but it's just travel man so i think if they do that have a a year like an asia cup sort of thing so it's like super and japan get the top and bottom play in a tier one and a tier two comp so you can still win trophies mm. um like there's a system like that that might be viable i know that they're doing something in saudi with uh, saw that yeah yeah Qatar. like six nations and like the rugby championship yeah yeah so they do like a it's kind of like a mini world cup type thing that'll be cool yeah that'll be super cool to watch because it's like the best teams and the best teams from like europe yeah because i always say this about like i always say this about international rugby versus international league like international league is just the nrl yeah they just throw guys in different uniforms yeah. that are aligned with like nationality which is great. And realistically, maybe the Samoa Tonga game is the one that people watch. But you look at the international game of uh, rugby union, it's like you might not see these guys have the chance to play each other for a long sure. time. You know what I mean? And the way Ireland play rugby, which is 
best to watch versus the way England play rugby when they come down there and yep. challenge the All Blacks. It's always really interesting because the styles of play are so different. The dynamic of, of players and that uh, dynamic of different teams. And that's sort of the other part is around, um, what's it called? Uh, the British Irish Lions play against like a hybrid All Blacks Australia team or All Blacks Australia South Africa. Oh, I would pump him. Yeah, but it'd be sick to watch. Yeah, okay. Good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it'd just be like, because see, you say straight away, I will pump them. Yeah. You say that in front of an English. Um, English person, I would say, fuck off, mate. Like, you know, like, there's no way that you beat us. <laughs> but it's like, that's that's the reason why it's interesting. Because mm. it's like the conversation, you know, and the, the idea of it. Um, but yeah, bro, like there's there's so many different ways and avenues. And that's the, the upside of rugby is it's, it's a world game. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I see, like, um, like rugby league will look at union and go internationally, this is the dream, and then union look at league and like club land, this is like the dream. It's always, oh, always one you can't have. League, league players always used to say to me, Is that like, I really want what's do you know? I want to come over and play, like, I, like I want to travel and like see the world. And all of us can, bro, I just want to stay home. <laughs> I mean, like, I'd love to just like be able to play and stay at home. And so when I played club rugby in like 2017, 18, I think it was. And the furthest I had to travel for a game was the Gold Coast. Yeah. At like 3 p.m. game down the Gold Coast. I was loving life. So that was like an interesting time, bro, because it was like that whole thing where I actually got to stay at home and not travel. It was like you, you would spend at least half the year in hotels. Mm. It's like, you know, but it used to be fun when I was younger because it was so new. Then it was like, you know, as you get older, you're like, love your time at home. You love that aspect of having a routine, um, not being able to like live out of, out of a suitcase. So everything, as you said, one what you what you can't have sometimes. <laughs> yeah, always. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, when you're single, you want to be in relationships. When you're in relationships, you want to be sick. <laughs> no. um, next question, show side. Obviously, um, been in this game for a couple of years now. You've been, always been into fashion ever since we were kids and have money, like you try and dress the best you could of what you had. Uh, how's that experience been? Well, it's been, um, it's been super fun, man. Like there's ups and downs, highs and lows. Um, it's been some great lessons too. But it's just like, for me, the thing that I just love about it is that like, because it's so new to me, I'm just learning so many different skills, um, meeting so many different people getting insights into uh, a range of different things but as the brand grows uh, I just see the growth in myself and like especially through clothes I look back at our first drop and the stuff that I was putting out and like holy and I was so proud of it at yeah, the time yeah, yeah. I, like, I was like man I was just so proud to see it on people I just wanted to wear it everywhere um, and I look back at it and I'm like what was I doing but it was just like the, the growth of that and that's just from a like clothing standpoint. Then when I look at it from a knowledge standpoint of what I've learned, the things, the mistakes I made, um, the things that I just kind of like thought was, oh, okay, this, this person's doing that, you just cut and paste it type thing. And, but not understanding the why and how. Like just for a quick example, it was like something to do with shipping. And I remember going, oh, it's just kind of like going, oh, looking through heaps of brands that I liked or like going online and just sort of seeing what everyone did. And it was like, let's say someone does, you know, most brands were like a hundred dollars free shipping. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So like that's about, so hey, that sounds right. Like, let's just do a hundred dollars free shipping. And it's like everybody who purchased basically got free shipping. Mm -hmm. So we're paying for everyone's shipping. <laughs> and then so like the bill that we had for shipping, I was just like, Oh my gosh. They're like, he lost a lot of money because like, I just didn't understand that. I just was sort of like, okay, if everyone's doing that. And some of the brands that I was looking at weren't even clothing brands. Like, so their product. The, cheap. Exactly. So their cheapest product might have been like 50 bucks. So it was like, okay, if you buy two things, you basically hit. So then you had to buy the third thing. Just to get out of my <laughs> To get free shipping. That's obvious now. Yeah, yeah, it's so obvious now. Like, you sound like an idiot, but it's just like... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> um, how did you get the name Showsai? Showsai was just like, a lot of people always ask how to say it or I hear people saying like the wrong name. Um, 
but shosai just means detail in Japanese. And the reason I sort of came up with that name was that I was in Japan at the time when I decided to actually go ahead and start the brand. And then for me, detail was like the most important aspect of not only clothes, but life. And, you know, when we're talking about detail, it's in how you live every day. So having routine, discipline, great habits, and just all of that comes from the foundation of detail. You can't have good habits, good routines, um, and good discipline by having no detail in your life. So that to me just like really um, made sense to uh, use that in the clothing because even when I used to buy clothes, I'd buy someone's clothes, I'd buy a brand's clothing, and I'd be like, oh, I love this butt. Yeah, uh, they've just missed this. And then so like I'd think I'd go and try and change it myself, but I'd also be like, okay, if I made a hoodie, I want it to be like this. You know, like um, finally to me, I've been able to like kind of, kind of like fit the hoodie to how I like to wear it um, and other things. But I just think the, the smallest of details make the biggest of difference. What's the biggest misconception that or – What's like? What's something that's very unassuming about being in in the clothing game? Oh, okay. Obviously, I've got my, I've got my yeah. opinions, but what's yours? Well, there's you can you can answer this uh, many different ways, but it's like the biggest misconception to me is how easy it is. So people think you okay, so you buy a t shirt for ten dollars, you sell it for fifty, and you make forty dollars. It's not how it works. Like you know what I mean? Like it sounds like there's a like. A lot of money to be made. So, like, you just get a T-shirt, sell it for fifty bucks. You bought it for ten. Like, there's your forty bucks. You do. You sell a thousand of them. That's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but like, the truth is, is that that T-shirt that you bought for ten dollars, the marketing that goes into it, how many of them you might give away for like advertising, for gifting, um, also like as we said, shipping. So it costs to get it to you. It costs it to get it to someone. Um, if you're going to put something on it, like the depth of it is just like, <laughs> you can go so deep into it if you yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Um, but it's just not as simple as that. You know what I mean? So it's like figuring out how you can maximize that $40 that if you're buying it for 10 and there's going to be $40 to be made, but there's all these other costs. And for me... The, the difference was is that because I play sports, it's not my day job, like I'm not reliant on this making money, but trying to figure it out and get it all set up, I was paying a lot of people to do jobs that I didn't know how to do and trying to figure out, oh, okay, so now I, I get it now. This is something that I can do and then I can slowly take money back out of it, you know what I mean? But yeah, this, bro, like that question just gets, gets me thinking about everything now, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the hardest things to do, and especially in the space on the clothing where you're in, where the design focus is like trying to sell what's on hand, uh, trying to get rid of old stock, market new stock, and plan for stock in the future. Because yeah. by the time like your new stuff comes around and it's ready to get pushed to market, you've already been looking at it for six, yeah. seven months. Hey. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you half get over it. And yeah. you're like, oh, fuck. Is anyone going to like this? But the consumer hasn't seen that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so yeah. I always struggled with that. That's a huge thing for me. Yeah, that's, that's like, as soon as I get new stuff, like I look them all and I'm like, I hate it. Yeah. I, and then I'm like, oh, everyone's going to hate that. They haven't even seen it. But I'm excited about this stuff. And then I see it for a couple of weeks and then I'm like, oh, everyone's not going to like it. And so it's one of those like imposter syndromes as well. So I, I think like, okay, like I don't even know what I'm doing. Like this is going to go shit. Like fuck it. Like, mm. nah. And then I get like, kind of want to be, be a little bit destructive. It's kind of like what I was talking about with rugby. Now I'm starting to understand, take my ego out of it. Now, why did I start making these clothes? Because I like them. doesn't mean if, if everyone doesn't like them, okay, I can live with that. But I want them to like it because I want them to buy it and I want this business to work. But I also have to get my head around when I make something, I also got to keep in mind the audience as well, but they're not like the full focus, you know? But yeah, like it's, it's funny because even some of the new stuff now, we're getting ready for a launch in like two weeks. Um, all that stuff, like I still love it, but I'm like, we have another launch that's going to come out about a month or so after it. So we're already like focused on that. Like we're focusing on pushing this stuff 
also super focused on that. And then what's really difficult for me is like planning ahead. Yeah. Um, because, I, you know why? Because you live, you live week by le- week, most of your life. Yeah. Well, it's like me and you, we went and did um, groceries, right? And so for me, I always only buy groceries for that day or maximum the day after. Because I don't like planning too far ahead. Like it's scared. I'm like, oh, where will I be? What will I be doing? Um, you know, like in, in the sense of I know what my training and that that I have to do and what I need to eat. But I like to just go and get things that day because it's part of my routine. So then planning ahead with clothes and that, like it seems so far away from for me, like planning for September uh, and November. Right now, like our manufacturer is like pressing me about that. And I'm like, hold on, just like chill. Like I've got to sell stuff next week. And if that doesn't sell and I've already like paid for all the stuff for September, um, November, like it's it's really quite hard to get your head around. But that's just the the place that we're living in and that's part of the, the excitement. That's like game day, right? So when we have this launch, I used to get super nervous around launch because I just will be like, Okay, what if it goes bad? What if it goes bad? And you start trying to talk yourself out of it. And then it goes well and you're like, Oh, okay. You know, so can breathe for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, but it's like it's bro, it's even just like uh learn a valuable lesson the other day or uh, the other week about it's also just being honest with your customer. And something went really well and they dropped before, so we basically like ordered a heap more of that, like large sizes. And then the next drop, the large sizes didn't like sell as but the clothes were totally different. So it's like, oh, okay, it's not just because we got a audience with large sizes it's they like that particular stuff so then we're like okay so what are we gonna do with the stock and should we just give it away to charity and because i i really enjoy the fact that being able to have a clothing brand i are coming into winter being able to help people who may not be as fortunate so we end up going putting aside uh, a big portion of the sizes to be able to give away and then we did this like a, uh, it wasn't necessarily a sale, but we just put everything on the website at a certain price. And we just told everybody up front, hey, we ordered way more of the big sizes than anticipated. So everything's going to be so 40 bucks. Mm-hmm. And pretty much everything sold out in like about 24 hours, maybe just a bit more. Yeah. Over the space, we launched like Friday, 6 p.m. And it was all gone by like Saturday, Saturday night, something like that. And then we still had able to keep that bit and give it away to charity and get messages in from people who were in those charities um, who said like, oh, you know, like it's changed, changed my life, like being able to have new clothes. Yeah. Like I feel confident about going. Like there was young kids who go to school in that who messaged me saying, oh, you know, the new clothes, thank you so much, gave me the confidence to go to school knowing that I had like nice so fresh clothes and yeah. fresh and it was like not something that was ragged and um, holes and it was something like that. So like mm-hmm. for me, that that is an aspect that I was like to the team moving forward, I want to continue to do that and whether we, when we get our product, we put aside a, a, a part of that at the start so that like if we sell out of everything, we have that part that we want to give away to charity regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, because like it's just one of those things that as someone in a privileged position, that feeling of being able to give back is like super important. And it just continues to make you understand and feel grounded and appreciative of everything we do have. You know, like even running a business, it gets hard, but it's quite a privileged position to be in to be able to run a business, right? Well, that's my opinion. Mm, I love that. Um, we've talked about this in the past, but like, do you ever feel guilty about being successful? We've grown up basically the same. Same sort of household, same hometown. Obviously, you've gone on to be a lot more successful than I have in terms of um, football career and probably monetary-wise. And I think one thing we both do, is like we try and take everyone with us. And a lot of the times, we end up getting burnt. Yeah, bro. Like, I, I don't think guilty is the, the right word, but what, what happens with me is, like, I want to help everyone. So, like, I see someone even, like, say, um, for example... At a, at, a re, at a grocery store, you, like I'll see a family and they've got like a big um, bunch of groceries and I'm like, 
I just want to go and pay for it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, that's how I feel in my head. Uh, sometimes I see um, my mum and dad and and my mum will message me about something and I'm just like, yeah, don't worry, I'll, like, I'll sort it out or whatever. But it's like, you also just can't do that all the time. You know what I mean? Because it's like, at the end of the day, I know that I've gotten to where I am through hard work, but I also know that I've gotten to where I am through the help of a lot of other people. You know, so I understand why we want to go and help everyone. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to be quite selective with that. I think that that's also a skill. Um, I think that's what I'm learning like recently. Yeah. Bro, it's a, it's, it's a skill, man, because like, and it's the same with friendships, bro. It's like, just because you know known someone a long time doesn't mean that that friendship is like good for you. You know what I mean? Because sometimes like people come into your life for a small period of time, but you also got to be a good judge of character to be able to say, okay, this person is helping me with this, but they also get this out of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like, that's where it's like that part of, I want to help this person. Like, but am I going to get burnt by doing it? You know what I mean? So, it's a really interesting space to be in. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. Where do I draw the line? Yeah. Well, like, I'm really... So, like, a few years ago, I used to have this thing where I'd say, like, I used to call everyone my friend, right? Like, that that I associated with. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I say this to them, but it's just, like, I can basically now say, these people are my friends. These people are an acquaintances. So, they're, like, at a certain... Like arm's length distance. Yeah. So there's certain things I will and won't do for them. Um, and then like, so those people on that inner circle is like, I know that I'll go and do whatever it is if they needed anything, whether it was um, financial help, whether it is just somebody to talk to, whether it's um, just time, um, those type of things. Um, advice on certain things, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, um, my deepest and dark, darkest secrets and that but with guys on their outer who are just acquaintances and those people might not necessarily know that they're on their like outer level because i'm still like anything to everyone but it's just that i know what i need to continue to function at a certain level the type of people i need around me and that and also the type of people i want around me you know so it's like once i was able to differentiate that and learn that skill then that was a point where I was able to make sort of huge inroads and gains in my own life because I was holding myself back by accepting everyone and just saying oh yeah they're we're all friends so someone asked me yeah 100% yeah you know what I mean mm. yeah I've got you I've got you don't don't worry I've got I've got it so you put yourself out by looking after people that aren't, don't necessarily have your best interests at heart yeah and it's hard to get like I've got it with you but I wouldn't have it with too many other people yeah. where I've got a friendship where like it's not transactional. Like yeah. you don't need anything from me. I don't need anything for you. But we just kind of, it's bro, it's refreshing. Yeah. And bro, the the thing with that man is, is like, those are the relationships that you invest in. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way we invest in our brands, invest in whatever stock market or whatever. You put time into those because it's not, as you say, it's not transactional. So it's not, there's energy, bro. It's like if you're, if it's transactional, like at some point I'm just taking, 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 taking from you. Now there's going to be a point where you get the shits with me because it's it's one way and then you're going to expect something back. You know what I mean? Mm. So now when you're expecting something back and it doesn't come, what happens now? Yeah. You know what I mean? And sometimes it does come. Like you're sitting there waiting, expecting, and then it comes and then this person just give, 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 give. Oh, yeah, now we're good. We're good friends then. You know what I mean? Mm. But you dive into that and there's something that is actually needed at depth oh <laughs> i didn't sign up for this yeah, yeah they, they're like that yeah because i i'm like you bro like i used to give so much so much and then i got to a point where like i was expecting something in return bro and sometimes it was just a thank you yeah. you know what i mean like where we grew up is like you go to someone's house so you use your manners you have to help clean the house and yeah. then you say thank you on the way out so it's just like yeah i don't know so when you think about your childhood values Everyone grows up different. You just got to realize that too, don't you? Yeah, no, nah, I feel that, bro. But like I said, it, that's one of the things that like I feel that I've I've actually put time into figuring that out. So now the expectation isn't there for me. Yeah. 
because I know what I'm giving this person, mm. like the level of energy I'm giving. So the output's not a lot. So that when I do give time and energy to that person, I know that it's it's not exceeding my expectation. Got yeah, that makes sense. I was thinking about this the other day where um, like when I used to go into a room, I used to be myself every single time. Yeah. But I don't think every room, every circle, every meeting needs the full version of yourself. Yeah. And you just need to pick and choose when you rock up as yourself. Yeah, and that's that's why I said it's the level and how you give. So it's the same as social media. You're on our social media, and I don't really go into depth on my social media, but I give out enough. So I give out this version where it's not. Um, so I don't sit down and pour my heart out to social media, but I know that I have valuable experience in a lot of things. I give that out. So that's like a certain level. It's the same as we said, like social media is essentially a, a type of friendship. All those people who follow you are following you for something. It's like, okay, I need to give some type of energy to them, but it's not wholeheartedly everything that I have. You know, and there's probably some people who are really good at doing that and being able to give that full version of themselves Um you can't leave nothing for yourself, though, eh? But that's what I mean, you know? So then now you're a Kardashian that's like your whole life is filmed. Mm. So I think that maintaining a, sm like a, a smidgen for yourself and those people in that close circle that we spoke about that is basically behind closed doors is super important. Yeah, 100%. Um, relationship skills. Obviously, you sit in a pretty previous position, solid four out of 10 <laughs> on the look scale. Um, what's your thoughts on relationships as you sit here, um, as we sit here? Yeah, I mean, like, it's an interesting one. Uh, Do you reckon they can survive in today's day and age? Oh, mate, like, there's, there's a lot of, like, surviving relationships. Um, me, I'm very proud of all, you know, my relationship stuff. And, like, I don't really put anything out on social media or anything like that from seeing someone or anything like that. Um, you know, I see people that are quite like open and frivolous with it like you see someone with a girlfriend posting pictures of them like you know one week and then two weeks later they disappeared and then there's a new person in there like three weeks later you know what i mean shout out jordan to me <laughs> <laughs> that's just it's just not for me bro like i get um i'm like once once i do have a solid relationship in that then that'll be out there like the last girlfriend i had was like like proper full-time um, was like six, five years ago or something like that. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think about like relationships a lot, like recently, but like even like the amount of temptation is out in the world, like, um, temptation for everyone to, they always think the grass is greener on the other side. And we talked about Instagram and social media a lot. Like, it's not hard to like find like other girls, and you're always going to, like, how we talked about before with rugby, you're like, the boys that have played league want to go travel or the boys that play union want to stay at home. So I don't know. Like I, when I think about it, there's no like really strong um, influences of great relationships because I'm only looking online. I feel like the best relationships are the ones that are, like you said, private or behind the scenes or stood the test of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting, bro, because it's like there's just so much access, right? Like so, as we said, like um, if you think someone's good looking, you can just – like, hey, what's yeah, like back in the day is like well, I want to say back in the day, but like um, there's a lot of a lot more work that had to go into it, so that when you were in a relationship, it seemed a lot more solidified. Mm. Whereas like nowadays, it's um, it's a lot easier to have like so for people to come and go because the access that that you have. Yeah, you know, what I mean? does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because you you see. That like now if you follow someone or something, oh, everyone's like, oh, you seen this person or whatever, you know. So it's like, oh, or whatnot. But yeah, um, bro, this is probably one of those conversations where we need Jay Simeon. <laughs> He's the last. But I was thinking about him. Yeah, you know how we're talking about subscription models today. Um, I reckon like there'd be a market for people that one picking up girls because mm -hmm. a lot of people I know girls that um do hinge profiles. Yeah. And Tinder profiles, that's their job. They help people oh, yeah. set that up. And I was thinking about something the other day. I was like, bro, you'd be perfect at this. And then if you get to the other side of when people are breaking up and how you get past this. Because I, I just... Hitch. 
Yeah, he, I feel like he could do that because he's like he's got enough about him. You'd obviously have to study like the psychology, but he I mean, he'd be done two or three online courses and basically ripped all the material from it. Yeah, it'd definitely be a space for it. Oh, fucking us. Oh, there's, there's that many Mo, dating. Mo start signing up. <laughs> Oh, those two together. <laughs> yeah. Heartbreak horrors. Yeah. Um, bro, what's your plans for the next five years? Next five years, bro. Um, well, like I'm I'm at the uh, latter end of my career with footy. So like ideally I want my business, show sign that to be in a in a space that I can walk into that when I finish and be able to like put a majority of my time into that. Um Outside of that, bro, like I'm just enjoying learning about business. Um, do you enjoy being in like business? Like, because I remember when I left football, I was gonna go. I was like, I'm. There's never gonna be a group of friends like this, or the conversations yeah. that we have. And when you're at that age in your mid twenties, and it's about chasing girls and partying and, yeah. and going on benders, like that's what you talk about. But I remember you coming into a meeting with me and Jakey from G'd Up, and you're like, Fuck, like, yeah, being excited about because it's the path where you're going. Yeah, and you're, just, and you're novice, bro. You hundred percent everything. That's the thing, bro. Like, I'm right now, I, I know where I'm at in this space. Like, so, and it's one of those things, bro, is like when you retire from sport, like you're late 30s or mid 30s, some, something like that, right? So you're still super young. And so going into clothes while I'm still playing, when I came into that meeting, seeing guys who have been in that space for a long period of time were successful in their own right and the things we were talking about, I was like, yo, this is like, I love this because it was like, it was like being in a strategy meeting for a rugby game. Mm. Cause everyone was trying to figure out, okay, how do we beat this team, which is the manufacturers, the um, logistics, and also the consumer, right? Like, how do we figure out a way to be able to make all of this work? And just that conversation was super interesting to me. Um, but like the business conversation for me being at this level, I understand I'm at this level, but I also understand the experiences I've been through. So I'm not afraid to speak up if I think that I know something, but also to ask a question that may seem stupid. Because I think that that is the most important thing is like, I had this conversation with, um, one of the girls um, who's starting her own brand from the Matildas, which I'm super excited for and I'm looking forward to being able to support that with Alana Kennedy. Um, but we're having this conversation about it. She's asking me a few questions and I just said, look, one of the main pieces of advice I'll give you is do not be um, too shy and too proud to ask questions about things you don't know mm. because you don't want to sit in a meeting and go, I didn't understand any of that or and I'm paying for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly and, and you're the one paying for it because it's just like one of those things where you go the question might sound really stupid to me but it might be a really good question and you also will get an answer to it mm. like because these people know and there's no point like you're not going to grow you're not going to start understanding that because every question you ask and get an answer to or if you don't get an answer they don't know it and you go find an answer that little bit of knowledge is going to be growth. So then you add those up daily. And so, like I just said, I'm down here, but this is where I'm trying to go. If I'm not going to ask those questions, I'm down here and I'm going to stay there. Stay there. No, no, it's just funny. Um, so, yeah, next five years. So, show Sai, hopefully, walk, finish your career, walk straight into that. Yeah, that's 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 the plan. Um, you know, like, got a few other sort of business things that we've got um, sort of on the move and that, but. That is probably the main main focus because if I get that right, that's the 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 part that I really enjoy. So this is the equivalent of what rugby and sport was to me. Like fifteen, fashion. 15. Yeah. yeah, you know. So like, although I have other business interests, this one to me is like that one that is like could potentially just replace sport um, and have the same level of love, passion, maybe maybe more because it's a different um, place in my life. Um, it's a lifelong game too you know what I mean it's yeah. not like shit I'm ending soon you can play as long as you want 100% and the, the thing is is like there's there's been days where I've wanted to quit <laughs> but honestly like there's been days where I'm like fuck this shit like I'm fucking over this I'm gonna close it all down pack it all up and then we find out how we find a way um, to get through mm -hmm. and then like 
the feeling that, like that you have, the endorphins you get by figuring it out, like problem solving is one of the best feelings. But I mean, clothes is not going to be everything that I do. So like, I'm I'm really passionate about um, about like just for myself the growth that I can have in areas of my life when I finish playing that I never thought I'd even get into. So like, what I mean by that is like ahead we've got like we spoke about briefly this morning like father at some point mm. um like i feel like i look at some of my teammates who play rugby or some of my friends who are not involved with sport have jobs and then the fathers and stuff like that. i really admire the strength and character that they have i think that that's at some point it'll be something that i'd love to do um okay and, and be i think that that may hopefully is is within that that five years that we, we just spoke about Catch is just finding the right person eh? yeah to grow a kid with yeah to grow a kid with 100 percent. yeah um yeah anything else you want to talk about no appreciate your time okay i'm a brother appreciate it thank you